Hi everyone, my name is Justice Ortlip. I'm a product manager at Lextego. I'm here to take you through the Actio anti-financial crime and risk management solution that we have been working on over the last 18 months. This is our sixth uh, presentation at the Mojuloop convening where after we had started the build on this product about 18 months ago. The last 15 months have been spent exclusively building after we had done a POC for the first three months where we proved some of the performance and the concepts in the platform. I'm going to take you through our presentation fairly quickly because I want to get to the really exciting bit, which is a demonstration of the platform in action. For this PI, our biggest focus has been on what we would call content, where we have been implementing additional rules and typologies into the existing framework that we had spent the previous 12 months um, building. We'd also completed the development on entity resolution, which is a disambiguation of entities in the platform. And we had done some work on performance to improve the performance given in our current architecture. Over the last 15 months, we have been coming back and giving some feedback on the progress that we had made in the PI um, that had preceded the convening. Uh, this is a special moment for us because this is the opportunity for us to present our minimum viable product. And it gives me great pleasure to read to you, instead of just an update on our progress, the mission statement of the product itself. So Actio is an open source real-time transaction monitoring platform that can ingest transaction messages in ISO 20022 format and evaluate transactions for fraud and money laundering behavior using 35 pre-configured rules that support 31 predefined typologies. We'll take you through the platform in a little bit more detail over the next slide. Just for context, Actio is a platform that attaches to either a DFSP transacting system or a Mojuloop switching network and can receive transactions from either of those two platforms where it will do an evaluation using a rules-based um, evaluation engine. And the results are then either fed back to the client platforms or sent onwards to a case management solution where you can then investigate particular alerts for the financial crime that was detected. In our overall context, the fraud risk management solution is intended to sit adjacent or very near to the hub so that it can ingest transactions that flow through the hub, but we also wanted to be able to allow platforms that are not always feeding their transactions through the hub to also be able to send their transactions through to the financial crime and risk management platform directly. So for DFSPs who want to monitor their internal transactions or for DFSPs who want to monitor point-to-point -point transactions with maybe DFSPs that are not part of the ecosystem, they would always also be able to send their information through to the Mojuloop or to the Actio platform for a comprehensive overview of the transactions. Our platform commences from the point where we take on a transaction. Um, it is expected that there might be a payment platform adapter in front of the platform that would convert messages into the appropriate format for our TMS API. The Transaction Monitoring Service API collects all of this information and then passes it on to a data preparation service, which is hosted in NiFi. Um, where we do the um, pseudonymization of particular PII information, uh, where we do our entity resolution to disambiguate entities that are duplicated across the network, and also where we do, if you would like, um, enrichment of the data stream with additional data sources. Uh, we also here at this point write away the transaction history so that we could use that history as part of the rules evaluation process later on. The channel router and setup processor is the router that decides which rules and typologies will be invoked based on the arrival of a specific transaction. In our initial Mojuloop configuration, we are evaluating the final transaction that arrives um, so that we could have a complete view of the completed transaction with its ultimate status. But you could also evaluate all of the transactions every step of the way with perhaps different rules and typologies at different intervals. The rules themselves are invoked from the CRISP and the rules are then composed into particular typologies so that any rule that is executed on the platform is only executed once, no matter how many typologies utilize that rule downstream. We also compose the rules and the typologies across a number of different themed channels based on your operational requirements. 
We could theme a channel according to speed or available resources. Um, if you wanted a channel that could respond quickly to be able to interdict a transaction that is in flight, um, you would create a specialized channel for that and optimize it to run very fast and only focus on the rules and typologies that you need to handle for an interdiction process. Channels then feed into ultimately the overall transaction aggregation and decisioning processor where we take a look at all of the results from all of the rules, typologies and channels and combine that into a final result that is then sent to a case management solution. For our last PI, um, as I mentioned previously, we focused mostly on what we call content. So the, most, the, the, the foundation of the platform had been laid in the 12 months before. And we focused on just building out additional rules and typologies for this um, final delivery. We added over the nine rules that we had originally, we added another 26 additional rules and then expanded the scope of our typologies from two to 20 with an additional 29 to 31 typologies overall. We also completed an entity resolution process uh, development to disambiguate um, entities across the ecosystem. And then we also extended our data model with those additional entities so that we could run additional rules to evaluate the behavior of the um, account holding entities and not just the accounts where transactions originate and terminate from. The Actio data model was then extended. Um, our data model was originally based purely on an ISO 20022 implementation. So for example, here you could see the Payne 001 transaction and its breakdown and tree structure. The Mojo loop data was mapped to these messages. And then we mapped this inside our environment into a graph database where we could map accounts to another accounts through the transactions that connect them with a variety of attributes for these transactions. We would then interpret this model inside our rules engine to make it easier to find the data that we need to detect uh, behavior that might lead or indicate to financial crime or money laundering behavior in particular. When we extended the model with the Actio entity identifier, this is the disamb disambiguated entity identifier. So if you have a number of different um, account holders or device or um, MSISDN holders uh, that are identified across the network, we would run them through the entity resolution routine and assign a unique Actio EID to all of the entities that share enough common attributes to be considered the same entity. And we then also mapped this and extended our data model with this additional information so that we could now do evaluations at the entity level and not only at the account level. I briefly wanted to also just take you through the typology lifecycle because this for me illustrates the true power of the platform in terms of its configurability. The rules themselves are developed as rules modules that run um, discreetly and that you can link into a specific typology um, and a uh, flow through the network map. The rule configurations drive the rules behaviors. So every rule has specific parameters that determines how that rule functions and how its output is formatted and structured. From the rule configurations, those rules are then composed into a topology configuration. So the topology configuration determines which rules make up a specific typology. So for example, typology 28 over here, which indicates a scams typology consists of 18 rules and these rules and their score contribution to the typology is defined in the typology configuration. After the point where the rules development is complete, the deployment of the rules, the typologies and connecting that into the flow um, from the evaluation is handled through configuration only. So there is no need to do any additional development once your rule development is complete. You would drive the behavior of that rule through the configuration, link it into a typology through the typology configuration, drive the flow through the network map and all of this is stored in a config store. And once that deployment is, is live, you'd be able to do your ongoing calibration through the configuration of any one of these elements to be able to tweak how your platform operates in, in your actual real environment. I'm now going to hand over to Kyle, who's going to take us through a brief overview of the costing and the deployment. Thank you very much.
Uh, Hi everyone, my name's Carl. I work for Sovereign and I handle DevOps. I'll be running you through the Azure infrastructure breakdown and costing. So with our current setup, it will cost you about twenty-four to thirty thousand rand per month, or thousand five hundred to thousand nine hundred dollars per month. On the left hand side there you can see the breakdown for the current components we have in our infrastructure so disks we've got 28 public ip addresses three and so forth this is a low scale infrastructure with high performance you can also see there on the right hand side on the excel sheet we've got our kubernetes service which is hosted in the uk that's for our axio platform we've also got the axio container registry which is hosted in the west of the us Okay, next I'll be running you through the Axio deployment demo. So this demo will consist of running through the documentation and a few things to check um, when running through Jenkins and yeah. observing on OpenFast and on the cluster. Okay, now I'll be running you through the actual deployment guide, which is the documentation hosted on our Confluence page. So it can be found there under the actual platform developers documentation. Wow. Okay, so for the instructions, we have four steps. For some reason, I don't know what happened. I thought I checked this properly, and I'm very embarrassed to say that something went wrong. <laughs> What's um, wrong? We can hear you fine. I, for some reason, the... the Hi, everyone. My name's Carl. I work for... So, so uh, Kyle, are you playing the video on your side? So we're playing the video. Um, I'm trying to find. Yeah, for some reason the screen is frozen, so I can only see where I ended off and did the handover. I can't actually see Kyle's video. So if you don't uh, mind, I I'm think that is Kyle's video. Is he showing anything else? Just keep into the video. Uh, I'm not presenting see. anything, so my connection is terrible. Sorry, sorry. So I'm trying to. Um, just give me a sec. I'm going to share up from my side. Hi everyone, my name's Carl. I work for Sovereign and I handle DevOps. I'll be running you through the Azure infrastructure breakdown and costing. So with our current setup, it will cost you about twenty-four to thirty thousand Rand per month or thousand five hundred to thousand nine hundred dollars per month. On the left hand side there you can see the breakdown for the current components we have in our infrastructure. So disks, we've got twenty-eight public IP addresses, three and so forth. This is a low scale infrastructure with high performance. You can also see there on the right hand side on the Excel sheet, we've got our Kubernetes service, which is hosted in the UK. That's for our Axio platform. We've also got the Axio container registry, which is hosted in. Apologies. The screen isn't changing on my side, Kyle. <laughs> I don't know why not. Um, Kyle, could you please do the demo he, on your side? Are you able to? He hasn't, he hasn't change? changed yet. No, it doesn't change yet. It should only change in about a minute or so. The rest of the US. Okay, next I'll be running you through the actual deployment demo. So this demo will consist of running through the documentation and a few things to check um, when running through Jenkins and observing on OpenFast and on the cluster. Okay, now I'll be running you through the actual deployment guide, which is the documentation hosted on our Confluence page. So it can be found there under the actual platform developers documentation. Wow. Okay, so for the instructions, we have four steps. Step one is home charts. So I've created one subchart with multiple home charts, and those home charts consist of Nafi, OpenFast, Elastic, Rango DB, uh, Key Cloak, and so forth. Um, I created one subchart for easy installation, so one command line to actually run to install all the different homes. Okay, so for step two is the configuration. This configuration is only there for if you want to increase the different performance and stuff on your cluster. It's not needed because all the default configuration is held in step one in the home charts. Okay, so I'll quickly run through this. Step three is running Jenkins jobs to install the processes and then step four is the conclusion. So as you can see all the different home charts that will be run, you can run it adding the repo Vice versa, step two is the configuration. So the NAFA configuration, we've got the different ingresses, node ports, the configuration of the Prometheus. I've added extra things, information here regarding the NAFA. We've got open fast configuration. We've got the different namespaces, ingresses. It just explains all the different details, how to deploy this charts. Uh, we've also got how to deploy dedicated node types. 
how to install the different plugins, how to use the key stores. We've got how to enable snapshotting. Okay, so for Jenkins, I didn't add anything else. I added a README here for better view. We've also got the Redis configuration over here. This is just the common configuration needed. We've also got the bootstrapping of the cluster. We've got the cluster topologies. We've got using of password files. Okay, for key, key cloak, we've also got the different settings, the database setup. Also existing secrets if you want to add. We've got the admin users. We've got auto scaling and a Rango DB with the README. <clears throat> Step three, running Jenkins jobs to install the processes. So each process needs to be run through Jenkins after every after the home files have been run. So all rule processes will also need to be run. So this is the Jenkins deployments for all the deployments for the different processes. Um, you can also view them on OpenFast and on your cluster. And then the conclusion after all these things have run, you have a working cluster. So on Jenkins, I'll just quickly show you. So the deployments, you'll go to deployments. You'll select one of the processes that you want to run. So you select build now. It will start up a job. That job will run. You can actually go to the console outputs over here. You can actually see by scrolling down, each of these will kick off different steps. And once it's completed, it will start building, and then it will complete, and it will deploy, and it will say accepted. You can also view that on OpenFast for the different processes. You'll see that it will say it's ready, so it's ready to be used. And lastly, I'll quickly show you on the cluster. So once everything's run, you can actually see in your different pods for all the different rules and all the different processes. Thank you so much. You must have a great day. Oh. Hello. Hello everyone. I am Johan Foley and I've been working on the F4M project for a couple of months and uh, I will be taking us through a end-to-end -end showcase of the platform as it is now as well as then go over to showing a performance test that we've conducted. So to start off with, I'll be making use of JMeter to submit one of each of the four different Mojo Loop messages to our platform. Um, it's in the ISO format, so um, we'll be submitting the Mojo Loop quote, then the reply when the, once the code's done, then the transfer, and the transfer, finally the transfer reply. And the, so I'll just go ahead and submit these transactions. And as they are flowing through the system, I'll be going over to our application performance monitoring or APM so that we can see what is happening under the hood. So I'll be going over the channel router and setup processor and I'll view the APM from this side. And the reason for that is the request that we've sent was going to the transaction monitoring API here or the TMS. From TMS, it went to NIFI for data preparation. And from data preparation, the request goes to the channel router and setup processor or the CRISP. Now, the CRISP is responsible for pruning the network map. And what that means is if the transaction comes in, then we decide what rules and typologies and channels is required to determine fraudulent transaction. So if we go to the CRISP, we'll see all the different uh, requests that was initiated in this trace. So the rules and typology process and CADROC and the TADROC and everything else that isn't even showing on this list. So on here, we can see that all the different rule processes were executed from the channel router. So each of these is the request going to all of the different rule processes. So this request actually went to rule two and so forth. So after it's pruned the network map, it knows where all the rules it needs to go and it starts sending up all these requests. Now, as the rule processes finish their results, we can see that the rules will send their results to the typology processor. So if I go and if I look at this one specific rule, this one was the last for one of the typologies. 
So if we look at what this rule process is doing, as we can see it's doing some logging that's in between here, and then it handles the transaction. Once it's gotten its configuration from ArangaDB, it then uh, needs to find some transaction history. So then it goes and gets that, and then it actually evaluates this rule's result. Once it receives its result, we can see it's sending off a request here to the typology processor. Once the typology processor receives this request, it will go to Redis to find the uh, the cache for all of this typology's um, rule results. If it finds that it has already received all of the rule results, it would then go over to evaluate the typology expression. So what it would do is it would take all of the rule results and depending if they were true or false, whatever the outcome might have been, it would then give this typology a score. Once it scored this typology, it would send this typology result off to the CAD proc. So all the channel aggregation and decision processor. The channel aggregation and decision processor will then take wait for all of the different typologies results. If it's received all of them, it would then determine a channel score and send it off to the transaction aggregation and decision processor or the TAD proc. The TAD proc will then send its result off to the content management system that will receive a report of the outcome of this transaction. So I will now go over to ArangoDB to just look like what this report would look like. And what we'll see is in there is the original transaction as it was received, the pruned network maps with all of the different uh, channels, topologies and rules that were required, and then a final report showing all of the different rule results. We'll see that it has a status of NALT indicating that, that this was a uh, a non-fraudulent transaction and we can see the timestamp when it was conducted. Uh, we'll then see that this channel had an outcome of zero, so that's a score of zero. Uh, we can see that the typology had a score of 100 and we can see that the rule results, this was a cash withdrawal and all the other rule results would also be in here. And this is the end-to-end -end transaction and the final report showing if this transaction was likely fraudulent or not. To then go over to the performance test. So the same JMeter application we set up in such a way that there was a thread group and this thread group is responsible to spin up multiple different thread to send all the different transactions. We set it up to have multiple instances of this application running, so making use of the CLI, of course, and we had a one instance running on a machine and another instance running on a server. So each of them would start up 500 sending threads. And what would be in those threads? We had a CSV data reader because we had a batch of 20,000 transactions um, each of those transactions being made up of the four different Mojaloop requests. So this CSV data reader would have, basically we had two files, each of the files containing around 10,000 of these transaction groups. And then what would happen is each time one of these threads needs a transaction, it would read one of the lines and then it would send a the quote request first, the Mojaloop quote or the Pano one request to the transaction monitoring service. Once the Pano one message is finished and comes back, then the Pane zero and three message or the Mojaloop quote reply would then be submitted to the system. Once all of this is done, it reaches the Paxo two message, which is the final message, and this message will then be also uh, validated for fraud. So the reason why we had this set up where it's important to have the messages in the correct flow is because if the, as we know, the transfer reply message is a very small object with very minimal information. So a lot of the rule processes then needs to go back and find some additional information from either the or a transfer or the original quote or something like that. So it's it's important that they go in the correct order. And this is also then to simulate a real world example, um, as this is the order that messages will throw through the system. 
And then once all of these requests are sent, uh, we had a final aggregation, aggregate report uh, that will go through now. So that is just a text file that basically keeps on logging um, as the, the performance test ran. So to look at the outcome, we can see that the test was started at 2 minutes to 9, and the transactions were finished submitted to the platform at 10, uh, 10 minutes past 9. So the test ran for about 12 minutes. So that's how long it took to submit the 20,000 transaction groups or 80,000 transactions to the platform. So the performance, we can see there was outcome from the server as well as from the PC and the server as it was running on the same environment as what our uh, application is running as uh, at, which is in uh, Kubernetes environment hosted in UK West. Um, we can see that the minimum latency there was one millisecond, uh, whereas from the PC, uh, the minimum latency was 173 milliseconds. So this PC is in South Africa, so that was the minimum latency. Uh, that's good to keep in mind. Um, so the summary was 40,000 transactions were sent in 10 minutes from the server. Uh, that evaluates to an average of 35 sec um, transactions per second. Um, the average latency for a response was around 7 seconds, and the max latency was 60 seconds. The PC, on the other hand, also submitted around 40,000 transactions. It took 12 minutes to submit the same amount of transactions uh, with a lower average throughput um, and average latency. The reason being, for every one of the requests, there's an additional 170 milliseconds up and down um, for those results to come back. So that's why the average throughput was slightly lower. Um, and if we calculate it all, uh, the outcome is quite similar for both of these. What is interesting to note is that the queue that was built up as we were submitting these transactions only finished about 13 minutes after the last transaction was submitted to the system. So we have some reports to go through um, that was taken at the time of uh, at the time of this load test as it was running. And in these dashboards, we can see all of the different processes that we hit, um, the total amount of transactions that was going through all of them, and how all of them um, performed in terms of the amount of messages going to all the different rule processes and the average latency uh, in a 60 seconds uh, 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 timestamp. What is interesting and what I want to put your focus on a bit is this request per minute or the APM that was calculated when we were running this test. So this test starting at just before nine and then finishing the, the transactions being uh, all submitted to the system at around 10 past nine and then the final outcome when it was completely done processing the entirety of the queue. What is interesting to note is we had a, a uh, average APM of around 5,000 requests per minute um, while we were spamming the system with transactions. So we can see the ramp up period and then we can see it was around, it was averaging out to around 5,000 transactions per minute. That's while it's getting all the new transactions in. And then as we stop submitting new transactions to the system, we can see that it actually speeds up and it has more resources assigned to the rest of the processes, which was then able to ramp up to around 10,000 requests per minute going through the rest of the system, just processing this uh, load of transactions. So this was a quite an interesting statistic for us. There is an additional report that we've got and that is the response times in APM so we can see at the beginning uh, the response times uh, it made a peak there and then it was quite high and then as we stop sending transactions or the bulk of the transactions uh, we can see that it plateaued and all of the response times for all the rest of the services um, was then very uh, very short and under under a second very very short we can then have a we then have a statistic here for the total combined response time for all of the different services. Um, so this is just interesting to note. Um, we can take a look at which of the processes or which of the rules might be exceptionally slow um, as we have a combined response time. Um, so that's uh, the last bit of statistics that we've got. 
and that is basically the outcome of uh, our performance test. So since we are not an interdicting platform, uh, the decision was made that we are not going to spend too much time to focus on scaling up the platform to such a way where we'd be able to handle this load of transactions in a reasonable time. And what this performance test then shows us is if you were to hit the system with a big load of transactions in a in a short time, uh, we are able to build up a queue and then process them off as we've got some more time. This is important to note as we are not interdicting, there is no specific benchmark that we were trying to achieve. Uh, so we kept the cost down and just showed that we are able to process a big load of transactions, even if we are not uh, processing them in real time. So that was that is the uh, that is what we were trying to achieve with this platform, and we have a successful outcome therefore. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Foley. Um, the Thank you, Greg, for lending us a little bit of time from our follow-up presentation. Um, but if there is time, Simeon, we'll take some questions now. Uh, apologies for the hiccup in the middle of our presentation, but uh, hopefully we can take um, a minute thanks, for questions. Thanks, Greg. Um, I will, we're over time by two minutes, but I'll just take one question from the floor. Uh, John Mark, a short one, please. <laughs> Uh, Simeon, yes, I'm sure you also don't like fraud, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So uh, this is a very important topic uh, for the industry. Uh, maybe just as a comment, I know from where I sit, at least in my organization, uh, we are making very big investment uh, in uh, fraud. Uh, what that tells is that um, the team doing this this work, um, it would serve of course, the big and the small, there is a lot of demand out there for fraud solutions. Uh, what I've seen is that uh, because of the shortage of um, um, what you could call the open source uh, solutions in this domain, uh, we tend to quickly say, get maybe the, the bank laid platforms um, that um, are already tested from a banking perspective, but actually we've discovered they're not so tuned to uh, our kinds of setup, um, wide setup. So um, my question would be, I've seen you have a component payment platform adopter. Uh, I would want to understand how flexible and robust is it? Why this is important is that many times when you're deploying these solutions, uh, data comes in different formats. So a solution that serves well would normally uh, have to, uh, the flexibility of uh, taking data in different formats. Then in, in the same regard, I've seen that uh, your solution currently is rule based. Uh, the kind of uh, platforms we are doing, the switch, we expect would have a magnitude of uh, transactions in uh, tens of millions of hundreds of millions. Now, the new approaches as, that are being sold out um, have machine learning and AI uh, central to them. So what are your views around uh, how we could uh, grow this platform to, to, to use uh, machine learning and AI, and of course, be more competitive to serve a platform with a very huge volume of transactions. Thank you. Two questions in, in one, one I'm going to address the first one first. So the payment platform adapter has not yet been constructed, but we know where it would fit in the architecture. From a Mojuloop perspective, Mojuloop currently speaks Mojuloop according to the Mojuloop API. And the um, system that we have built took a ISO 20022 implementation view of a Mojuloop transaction. So in between those two, you would still need an adapter to fit the um, Actio system to Mojuloop itself. We had taken the design for that through the architecture forums already. So um, it's a question of building that now. The payment platform adapter and the way that it's structured is along the same philosophy as payment platform adapters would be structured for Mojuloop. You would know that you would sometimes have a DFSP that can't convert or speak directly to the Mojuloop platform. So you would sometimes have to build an adapter between that DFSP and Mojuloop. It's a similar situation for us where you would build an adapter for somebody who doesn't natively speak the same language as the, the Actio platform um, to convert the messages. So that the complexity of that would differ from one implementation to the next. Um, 
That's the most flexible we solution we could come up with to maintain a standard backend rather than having to adapt the backend to every implementation. The, the second question is around machine learning and AI. So that becomes a little bit more of a complex question. Our philosophy with building the Actio platform up front is to be able to provide people with the basic functionality that they need to be able to detect fraud and money laundering in their environments. There are more complex solutions out there. The platform itself can be extended to include artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, it would probably be more used to calibrate the rules and the typologies. So the configuration that you would want to do on an ongoing basis to improve the functioning of those rules should largely be driven by a machine learning exercise based on the entire body of data accumulated over time and then run through a machine learning routine adjacent to the platform and then create a feedback loop into the platform to maintain the rules and the typologies to say, you know, this rule needs to be tweaked a little bit in this direction, or we this rule is not adding any particular value to the typology, so we can save system performance by perhaps removing it. That's where we see the next iteration to include machine learning as a way to improve the platform's operation. We could also insert machine learning into the platform as a channel so that you could ingest data and run machine learning adjacent to some of the rules. You don't necessarily need to evaluate every kind of fraud typology or every money laundry behavior through machine learning. There is still value to be garnered from using basic rules to, to, to do that kind of evaluation. So we could, I would see those two things as working together side by side in the platform and perhaps running into separate channels um, orchestrated then by the, the, the CRISP at the front. Thank you. Uh Michael, briefly. Yeah, yeah, this is not a question. This is just uh, really to add something on to just a answer to the sure. first of John Mark's questions, which is to say that um, we've got some uh, adapters which convert between uh, FSP IOP messages and uh, ISO uh, PAX 008 and PAIN 001 that we put together for the hackathon. So uh, they are still around, and I think if you want to get a leg up uh, by using those, you'd be most welcome. Awesome. Um, just, just Johan, thank you so much. A round of applause for them. And Kyle. Thank you very much, everybody.